Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month virtual event featuring former Iowa Senator Tom Harkin, who was one of the co-sponsors of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, about 30 years ago, uh, 30 years ago this year. We're very excited to have him on. I'm Ryan Bauer from the Office of State Human Resources, and I want to welcome you to today's event, which will include a panel discussion of state employees during our second hour, beginning at approximately 1110 a.m. But before we hear from Senator Harkin, I want to introduce the Director of State Human Resources, Barbara Gibson. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, and thank you to our state employees, our human resources professionals, our disability advocates, and individuals with disabilities for being a part of this virtual event today to recognize Disability Employment Awareness Month in North Carolina. A special thank you to Senator Harkin, for his participation today, for all of our panelists, for making time to share their experiences with us, and a huge thanks to the staff at the Office of State Human Resources for all the work in putting this together. I am Barbara Gibson, Director of the Office of State Human Resources, and our role is to provide human resources guidance and oversight to more than 82,000 state agency and university system employees. This includes a specific focus on making our state government workplaces more reflective of the communities that we serve, including individuals with disabilities. Governor Roy Cooper proclaimed October as Disability Employment Awareness Month to promote greater understanding and awareness of disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions that people with disabilities bring to our workplace. In March of 2019, I was proud to stand with Governor Cooper when he signed Executive Order 92, Employment First for North Carolinians with Disabilities. Surrounded by self-advocates with disabilities and allies from across the state, he established North Carolina as an employment first state to increase opportunities for fair wages, employment, and meaningful careers for individuals with disabilities. Additionally, events such as this one, the virtual conference presented in July to mark the 30th anniversary of the Americans Disability Act and our active recruitment of individuals with disabilities through job fairs reflect some of the ways that our state is committed to North Carolina's disability community. Speaking on behalf of all state government human resources professionals, we are grateful to Governor Cooper for his leadership in recognizing the value and the perspective that individuals with disabilities bring to the state government workplace. To support the Employment First Executive Order in North Carolina, we at OSHR have expanded our recruitment and outreach efforts to identify and attract people with disabilities for state employment, focusing on ways to promote employment opportunities. We have also implemented enhanced accessibility of the state application form, and we have improved the faci facilitation of accommodations during hiring through very clear, reasonable accommodation guidelines. We are building upon existing training programs to specifically highlight individuals with disabilities, including an opportunity to improve data collection so we can measure our efforts and we can measure our improvements. In July, to align with the 30th anniversary of the ADA and support Employment First, we launched the new voluntary self-identification of disability tool available for state employees. It is our goal to improve our understanding of the representative, representation, representation of individuals with disabilities in all types of jobs and build upon this understanding to recruit and sustain a diverse and inclusive workplace within state government. We aim to become a model to employers in the private sector as we build a more welcoming and inclusive workplace. At this time, I have the extraordinary honor to introduce a national leader whose work has made a lasting impact on the lives of so many of us, Senator Tom Harkin. Early in his career, Senator Harkin was tapped by Senator Ke Ted Kennedy to craft legislation to protect the civil rights of millions of Americans with physical and mental disabilities. He knew firsthand about the challenges facing people with disabilities from his late brother, Frank, who was deaf from an early age. 
What emerged from that process would later become his signature legislative achievement, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or referred to as the ADA. Immediately following passage of the ADA, Senator Harkin poignantly demonstrated the impact that we can make on the lives of those living with disabilities by being inclusive when he famously delivered the first speech from the Senate floor in American Sign Language. He delivered these remarks so that his beloved brother could understand and be a part of this momentous occasion. Growing up in the pre-ADA area, I witnessed the ever-present struggles of advocacy as my mother navigated a challenging path for my sister, disabled from birth in the early 1950s. As a mother myself, I also have witnessed the expansion of valuable programs and services that evolved from this important legislation to provide critical supports that children need. I am so grateful to Senator Harkin for the tireless work that made services more accessible and for fostering a process where talented, eligible job applicants can take their rightful place in our workforce. He has received countless awards for his lifelong efforts to champion the rights of people with disabilities, which includes being nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. Please join me in welcoming Senator Tom Harkin. Well, Barbara, thank you very much. Uh, am I up now? You are. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, well, Barbara Gibson, thank you very much for, for that very kind and overly generous introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of North Carolina's uh, 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 Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, as you know, this was started, the history of this is interesting. Uh, this was actually started in 1945 as Employ the Physically Handicapped act by Congress. Uh, it was basically aimed at hiring wounded GIs coming home from World War II. It was later changed into a month. And then in 1988, when I was in the Senate, we changed it one more time and designated October uh, as the uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, not a week, but a month. And that was in 1988. So thank you for letting me be a part of your of your celebration and uh, and uh, and focus on disability employment in North Carolina. Uh, I know, uh, first of all, I just want to say I know uh, that your outstanding governor, Roy Cooper, spoke earlier, I guess. I'm fully aware of his very strong support for full inclusion of people with disabilities, uh, in, especially in employment, in the employment area. So I just want to uh, make that statement about your governor. I know he's very much involved in this. And again, I want to express my appreciation for all that all of you do uh, in the Office of State Human Resources. Uh, thank you for all that you do to, in North Carolina to make our society more inclusive for all persons with disabilities. Um, thank you for making real the promises of the uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973, <laughs> IDEA, uh, ADA, HEA, the Higher Education Act, especially the TIPSID program, uh, the Olmstead decision, and now of course, WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which was the last bill I passed out of my committee before I retired in 2015. So thank you for all that you do in North Carolina to make real the goals and the promises of all of that legislation. So now here we are, we're celebrating 30 years of since passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act on July the 26, 1990. Uh, for me, it's I also celebrate 31 years because it was 31 years ago in September of 1989, when I first introduced the Americans with Disabilities Act with my chief co-sponsor, a Republican, Senator Dave Durenberger of Minnesota. So we got it through and it was a strong bipartisan effort, many Republicans, many Democrats coming together to get it, uh, to get it through. 
And so this year we've had a lot of Zoom rallies like this meeting uh, celebrating uh, both the 30 years, the progress we've made and, uh, and listing the challenges that lie ahead for full implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So 30 years, how have we done? Have we made any progress? Well, a lot of times people ask me, what was life like before the ADA? Well, life for eons, <laughs> for people with disabilities, was a life of isolation, of segregation, of institutionalization, living in institutions. It was a, a life of low expectations, a life of never being able to fulfill your dreams or aspirations. It was a life of hurtful language, crazy, lunatic, spastic, deaf and dumb, language like that. Language that demeaned you as a person that took away your very humanity. And so, we look back at 30 years and we can say, yes, we've made some progress. Quite a bit, as a matter of fact. There were four goals. There are four goals in the ADA. Full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. So those are our four goals. So we look back at 30 years and quite frankly, we've made some progress in full participation. We have more people with disabilities participating in all aspects of society. Um, so we've made progress there. Equal opportunity, there's more opportunities for persons with disabilities in all phases of, of life, uh, from living to participating to uh, being active in community affairs, running for political office, uh, and in business and in, in, employ and in, in the area of, of business independent living. We've made some great strides there uh, due not only to the ADA, but also the Olmstead decision, which basically said there's a constitutional right for a person with a disability to live in the least restrictive environment. So we've gotten a lot of people out of institutions living in the community with their friends where they want to be, not in an institution, but we haven't gotten completely there. There are still too many people living in institutions. Uh, and that's a lot because of the, what I call the Medicaid bias, uh, which funnels people with disabilities into nursing homes. I'm gonna have more to say about that in a minute, but keep that in mind. So we have a ways to go there, but it's the last goal, economic self-sufficiency, employment, that's where we have barely even moved the needle. It's sad to say that 30 years after the passage of the ADA, the unemployment rate for adults with disabilities is just about where it was 30 years ago. Over 60% of adults with disabilities are not in the workplace. Imagine that, about 65, 65 to 70%. That's just a blot on our national character. So we've got to do better there. Well, since I retired from the US Senate in 2015, that's what I have focused my work on, employment. Employment of persons with disabilities and get these words carefully, in competitive integrated employment. I'll keep using those words because they're so vitally important. And so we, at the Harkin Institute at Drake University in Des Moines, established something called the Harkin Summits. This is an annual summit meeting of the private sector businesses, uh, disability uh, advocates and groups, some government people to discuss best practices, to see what we can do to break down barriers to more employment and competitive integrated employment for persons with disabilities. We highlight successful businesses that have shown 
that hiring persons with disabilities is good for their bottom line. And I'll have more to say about that too later. Uh, so we've had uh, four, we have our next summit meeting in December of this year on December the 10th. It will be virtual, of course, just like this. Um, but you're welcome to participate, to join in. Uh, if you think you have something that you would like to add or to be involved in, please go to our website, uh, Harkin Institute uh, at uh, Drake University and uh, key in the Harkin Summit. And uh, if you would like, we'd love to have you participate on December the 10th. It'll be a one day meeting. So again, that's what we've tried to do is to, is to focus on employment of persons with disabilities. Now I mentioned, I think I did before I, yes, before I left the Senate, the last bill I passed that I came out of my committee was WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We changed from the old Workforce Investment Act because in a couple of ways uh, that I think is very meaningful. We tasked VR agencies to focus on youth, to prepare young people with disabilities for competitive integrated employment. One of the major things we wanted to do in WIOA was to change the present structure of young people being funneled into a dead end and low income job or occupation. So as I said, uh, we required uh, for the first time that VR agencies devote at least 15% of their funds to support young people with disabilities to prepare for competitive integrated employment. We sought to prevent another generation of young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities from being tracked from school into sheltered workshops where they are often paid a sub-minimum wage and given no opportunity for advancement or skills upgrading. Now, young people with disabilities must apply for services from VR and explore competitive integrated employment before they can try another option. My hope is that these two changes to the VR law are creating more opportunities for youth with disabilities to have positive work experience in the competitive labor market before they leave school. Research tells us there are certain predictors of work for young people with disabilities. And the number one predictor is that work predicts work. The most important predictor of work in is early work experience, doing part-time jobs after school, in the summer, at winter and spring break, on the weekends, but also doing volunteer experiences and internships and job shadowing. Another predictor of good outcomes for youth with disabilities and employment is good case management. This makes a huge difference. And that's where good coordination among agencies, folk rehab, schools, DD programs, one stops can really make a huge difference. And that's what we tried to do in WIOA, break down the silos and provide for more streamlined and outcome goals oriented coordination. And the basic thing on that was basically getting these young people with disabilities, summer jobs, job shadowing after school, volunteer work while they're still in school so they can explore themselves what they think they might want to do. Again, the key is to get more and more geared towards competitive integrated employment. There was an Accenture study recently that showed that hiring persons with disabilities and competitive integrated employment is good for the business bottom line. Well, I became aware of this, oh gosh, nearly 50 some years ago. My older brother, uh, I think uh, Barbara Gibson alluded to this, my older brother was deaf and, um, and I saw how he was discriminated against all his life from being shunted into a school for the deaf and dumb, or as my brother told me once, he said, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. And then he was not given any opportunity to pursue any of his dreams. When he was in high school at the Iowa School for the Deaf, uh, they asked him if he would like to be a baker, a shoe cobbler, or a printer's assistant. Well, he said he didn't want to be any of those. So they said, okay, you're gonna be a baker. 
So they made him a baker. Uh, he worked in a small bake shop in West Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, he'd go to work about three in the morning. Uh, and then every morning, uh, not every morning, but so often a, a man dressed very well would come into the bake shop, get a cup of coffee and a roll or something. And he started to talk to my brother. Well, my brother handed him cards and said, I'm deaf, please write it down. So there's began a conversation between this man and my brother. So one day this man asked my brother, Frank, how do you like being a baker? My brother said, I hate it. <laughs> so he said, well, what would you want? What do you want to do? And my brother said, well, I'm good with my hands. I like machinery. I like working on machines. And this man said, well, that's what I do. I, I own a business. That's, that's, that's my business. How would you like to come work for me? <laughs> well, I didn't know this man, Mr. Delavan, at the time. I got to know him later, of course. Uh, but he told me when he asked my brother that about saying, why don't you come work for me? He said, my brother took off his baker's cap and his apron and started to walk out the door with him. <laughs> Well, he did hire my brother. He took my brother down to this plant. They employed a couple of hundred people. They made jet engine nozzles. Imagine that for Pratt & Whitney and General Electric for jet engines that fly your jet airplanes around. And it took a highly skilled workforce working with uh, these very delicate machines. Well, anyway, Mr. Delavan turned over my brother to his, to his foreman and said, give Harkin a job, see what he can do. Well, as Mr. Delavan related to me later on, he came back a month or so later and asked the foreman how my brother Frank was doing. And the foreman said, my gosh, this guy's fantastic. He just never makes a mistake. He gets more parts out per hour. He's always on time, cleans up his workspace. He said, the guy's, the guy's amazing. Well, Mr. Delavan said, well, he was very intrigued by this. So they began to observe. He said, I wanted to observe what he was doing that made him so good. <laughs> he said, here's what we found out. The line on which he worked was very noisy. A lot of drills going and bells and clanging and people shouting. And he said, we finally found out it didn't bother your brother at all. He just focused right on his job and didn't bother him a bit. This is a true story. So Mr. Delaman said, you know, I hired your brother out of the goodness of my heart because I felt sorry for him. But after he worked there, I went out and hired more deaf people because it was good for my bottom line. Now, advance this by about 40 years. So about 40 years later, uh, after we'd passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, long afterward, I was invited to visit a Walgreens drugstore, a distribution center. There was one in Anderson, South Carolina and one in Hartford, Connecticut. Under the guidance of Randy Lewis, and if you never listened to Randy Lewis speak, I ask you to go to YouTube and look up Randy Lewis, it's fantastic. Well, he got Walgreens to do more hiring of persons with disabilities. And get this, I visited their distribution center they had 800 people working there and 40% of their workforce were persons with disabilities, 40% physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, combinations thereof. And get this, they were all in competitive integrated employment, which means the same job as everybody else, same pay, same hours, same benefits, same retirement, same healthcare, everything, everything the same with the same opportunities for job advancement. Doug Wasson, who at that time was the CEO of, of um, Walgreens told me, he said, you know, I don't, I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. He said, this is my most productive distribution center in the United States. I get more parts out per hour of individual work, fewer mistakes, less turnover of personnel. And he said, we save a ton of money every year because we don't have to retrain people. People stay here on the job. So the most productive distribution center is the one in which 40% of the workforce were adults with disabilities. Again, not in some 
categorized disability job, but in a job just like everyone else has. So again, this is our challenge, I think, going forward. And that is to really break down these barriers. That's why we did WIOA. That's why we made the changes to get young people ready so that they will start thinking they have to go to work and they, they are going to be asked to work in competitive integrated employment. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. So what do we need to do going forward? Well, here's as I see it. Human resources and companies need to do a better job of outreach. They need to make their outreach really meaningful, not just to publish something, but to have a real affirmative action of reaching out to the disability community to invite in qualified persons. Now, I wanna make it very clear. I have never asked a private employer to ever hire a person for a job for which that person was not qualified. But what does qualified mean? Perhaps a person may not be qualified at the, at the beginning, but through an adequate training program, that person can become very qualified through a, an adaptable training program. That's the second part of it. I've had so many employers come to me in and say, look, we tried to hire someone with a disability, but they couldn't get through our training program. Well, the more I looked at it, the more I found that the training program is a one size fits all. Well, you know, in the ADA, we have a requirement for reasonable accommodations for employers so that a person with a disability can do a job, reasonable accommodations. It would seem to me that a training program should also fall under that heading, reasonable accommodations. So a training program may have to be more adaptable for a person with a disability. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. Maybe it takes a different kind of instruction. Maybe the person is autistic and they don't learn the same way as someone else who is not autistic. But once learning it, they can do the job as well, if not even better than a person, say, without autism. So we have to think about our, the outreach the uh, affirmative action to get people to know that they're welcome and their training program is going to be one that will be adaptable for their disability. The th third thing we need to do is to ensure that there are skills upgrading so that people with disabilities don't get pigeonholed, put into a job, and then just get stuck there. Uh, there needs to be skills upgrading just like anyone else with goals and uh, so that a person with a disability on a job can look forward to perhaps more responsibility, um, maybe higher pay uh, in, in, in that occupation. But again, it, it all comes back down to another one thing I just want to repeat for emphasis sake, preparing youth, preparing youth and making sure that we get these young people while they're still in school to get them those kind of work experiences. So that's my message today. And that is uh, utilizing all the tools that we have, getting young people ready and to work with the private sector uh, to get them to understand that it's not just out of the goodness of their heart, but their business will be better if they hire persons with disabilities. The other thing I want to talk about today, just briefly before I close up, and that is what's ahead? What else is ahead? There's going to be some real challenges. First of all, as we come out of COVID-19, one of the things that we need to work together, especially I think those of you in human resources uh, and, uh, and, and state departments uh, working with uh, the governor and uh, working with state employment agencies is that when we start to rehire persons uh, as we come out of COVID-19 and we start to rehire persons that have been laid off, let's make sure that persons with disabilities are not in the last row. Let's make sure that they're in the front row along with everyone else when we start to rehire. 
let's not have it so that if someone is hiring 100 people, uh, rehiring, let's say, to build up their, their workforce by 100 people, sort of to be where they were before the coronavirus, um, let's get the word out that don't, don't just hire 95 people and then say, well, now who with a disability can we hire? Uh, look for persons with disabilities in the front row and put them to work right away, not in the last row. So that's one challenge. The second big challenge is also, I think could be a great opportunity. We know now that the work regime is going to change immensely in the future. It already is, both here in America and globally. And that is working from home. Uh, so many businesses now are recognizing that they can get the same work product, sometimes even more, uh, from an employee working at home rather than coming into a building. Well, therefore, they also save money on building space, rental, uh, heating, cooling, all, the, all that goes with having a workspace. And a person at home can work off hours. They don't have to be there just at a certain time frame. So more and more businesses, I think, are going to really be looking for people to work from home. My own son-in-law, for example, uh, is an IT specialist. <laughs> And uh, since March, he's been working from home. Uh, well, once in a while, he has to go in, but very seldom, but when no one's there. And, but mostly he does work from home and, and that looks like that may be the future. Well, this could be a great opportunity for persons with disabilities. I don't have to think about transportation, that type of thing, and they can work from home. But there are certain things we're gonna have to do to make sure that persons with disabilities can fit into this new work environment in competitive integrated employment. Number one, uh, reasonable accommodations again, reasonable accommodations. For a person with disability to be able to be in this work environment, they're gonna need what? High-speed broadband. Well, maybe they don't have that. Maybe they haven't been able to afford it. Well, it would seem to me that Two entities ought to be responsible for that reasonable accommodation. Government agencies, state, federal, maybe even local, to ensure that high-speed broadband is accessible for a person with a disability to work from home. And the private sector can do that too as part of their reasonable accommodations. So that's one. Secondly, software. People working from home are gonna need new software platforms. We need to make sure that when that software is designed, it's designed so that it is accessible to persons with varying kinds of disabilities. Uh, and so that software needs to have persons with disabilities at the beginning, helping to design that software. The third thing is hardware. Sometimes hardware can be pretty expensive too. Uh, the platforms that are needed uh, for working at home, for example, a person with severe cerebral palsy um, may not be able to use a keyboard and maybe their voice, maybe they can't, they're, they're, they're also, they cannot use a voice to text, but they can use eye movements. I'm sure many of you have seen this. We have new hardware. Now we're just eye movements can type out a text faster than you or I could use a keyboard. <laughs> it's fantastic, but it costs a lot of money. Well, wouldn't that also be a reasonable accommodation? But it would also open up a whole new vista for persons with very severe disabilities to be able to work from home. The third thing is making sure that we have adequate training and supervision for persons with disabilities working from home. Training, again, training that's adaptable and supervision. And the third is, I, is if persons with disabilities working from home may need a personal attendant services. Maybe not all day or whatever the work period might be, but maybe at different times to help them with different things. Well, how do we get that? Well, I mentioned earlier about the Medicaid bias. 
Right now, if you qualify for institutional care, Medicaid must pay for that institutional care. However, if you qualify for that institutional care, but you don't want to live in an institution, you want to live at home, <laughs> there you go, at home now where you can get a job and work from home, Medicaid doesn't have to pay for that. That's why we still have so many people in institutions. States have not lived up to their obligations under the Olmstead decision. Well, again, here's where we need to change Medicaid. And I'm hopeful that Congress in the next Congress perhaps will start to change Medicaid from a health model into a supportive services model so that Medicaid will be used as a supportive service that will enable a person with a disability not only to live independently in the community, but to work from home and to get those kinds of jobs that are there if that's what, if that's what they want to do. So think about that. Uh, and if you have any suggestions as you, we move ahead on this about changing that model from health model to supportive services model. Um, uh, this is the kind of input we would need from experts like you and how we, how we design that. But I really believe that's the direction we have to go. So that's 30 years, we've made progress. We've got quite a ways to go. Uh, but thanks to people like you who do this work every day, we are making changes, good changes, profound changes, not only in the attitudes, attitudinal break, breaking down the attitudinal barriers of people, uh, but also breaking down the barriers towards having a full inclusive life in our society for persons with disabilities. I will close with this one short story, uh, the story of M. Emily Hillman. Emily Hillman was a young woman with an intellectual disability, uh, was on an IEP, lived in a small town in Iowa. She finished her IEP and was immediately shunted into a sheltered workshop job at sub-minimum wage. One day she told her mother that she didn't like what she was doing. And her mother said, well, M, she, she goes by M, short for Emily. She said, well, M, what do you want to do? And M said, she wanted to be a barista. She wanted to have a coffee shop. Well, her mother later told me uh, she had no idea where Emma got that idea from, from television, maybe. Uh, furthermore, she said, well, Em, you know, you have to learn how to do that. And Em said, well, there's a school that teaches that. <laughs> sure enough, they found there's a, a barista school. I didn't know there was such a thing either in Minneapolis. So they took Em there and she learned to be a barista, how to make lattes and espresso and all that kind of stuff. They came back to their small town in Iowa. They found an empty storefront on Main Street with help from VR. Again, here's where VR came in, helped them with loans and things and support service. And M opened her coffee shop on Main Street. It was very simple at first. Uh, well, that was 10 years ago. Emily Hillman, now M's coffee shop, now employs four people, all with disabilities. She has a burgeoning small business. Uh, it is sort of the center where people come. It's now like a, an internet cafe. Uh, people come there not only for breakfast and, and, and coffee, but, at, but they come there for lunches. They have gatherings there of people and it has become just sort of the center. And here she is, she owns this business. She's running this business. Yes, she has some supportive help, of course, like we all need supportive help. But think about this. Here was a young woman shunted into a dead end job uh, at a shelter workshop, less than, less than the minimum wage, and now has her own business. And get this, they found a roaster someplace, I don't know how they do these things, but she now sells her coffee online. So you can go online, go to M's E-M-E-M-S, emscoffeecompany.com. And you can read her story. You can read all about her. And you can even buy coffee. It makes a great Christmas present uh, from M's Coffee Shop. So I always like to say that here's Emily Hillman, this young woman with a disability. She was told she couldn't do this or couldn't do that, had low expectations for her. And now here she is in competition 
with Starbucks. <laughs> well, that may be exaggerating, but to make a point, how many more Emily Hillmans are there out there that with the right support, with the right encouragement, could be doing what Emily Hillman's doing today? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, <laughs> I mentioned she lived in a small town in Iowa. You know what the name of that town is? Independence, Iowa. How about that? So this is what we can look forward to. More and more people with disabilities fulfilling their dreams and their aspirations. Uh, more and more employers hiring persons with disabilities in competitive integrated employment. And to me, uh, this will really then fulfill that final goal of the ADA, economic self-sufficiency for persons with disabilities. So again, thank you so much for inviting me to join you and for expressing my thoughts. Uh, and I hope that as we look to the future, if there's anything that we at the Harkin Institute at Drake can do to work with you or to answer any questions or to be supportive in any way in what you were doing, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Harkin. It was great to hear from you. And at this time, I wanna introduce Nancy A. Strike, the Director of the Division of Diversity and Workforce Services at the Office of State Human Resources. And Nancy just has a couple of questions for the Senator uh, before we wrap up this portion of our event. Nancy. Hi, Senator Harkin, and welcome to North Carolina virtually. <laughs> we are very pleased to have you with us today. And thank you for uh, those very inspirational and interesting remarks. We. Uh, share your, your passion for developing employment for individuals with disabilities. And that, that was just a great presentation about the history and the challenges yet to come. We do have the good fortune of having about 10 minutes left with you this morning. And so wanted to take this opportunity to ask a couple questions of you. Um, one that, that I was really interested in that struck me is early in your comments about the Americans with Disabilities Act you talked about the broad base of bipartisan support that you were able to achieve to get that law passed. And in today's political climate, it's just hard to, to recognize that outcome. Can you share a little bit about how you were successful in building that kind of bipartisan support to get this uh, important law passed for individuals with disabilities? Well, Nancy, first of all, um, we had on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, we had people that were interested in, in, in this. In this. Uh, you must remember that for the preceding 20 years, we had a lot of demonstrations by individuals with disabilities uh, against the structure of society. Oh, you ADAPT, for example, were in the, in the 80s were lying under the wheels of Greyhound buses uh, to show that they couldn't even get on the bus. Yep. Uh, we had demonstrations in Washington, D.C. One day, uh, uh, a number of ADAP people had chained themselves across Independence Avenue right by the Capitol at, during rush hour and just stopped everything. Uh, and then in March, um, uh, let me back up. So um, uh, we passed our bill in the Senate in September. Uh, of 89, but it got stuck in the house and we couldn't get it out. And we wanted to get it done before the next election. And uh, one day in March, a number of, and I won't go into the whole story, a number of individuals in wheelchairs rolled up to the Capitol, fell out of the wheelchairs and crawled up the Capitol steps. Capitol. Today, that's still known as the Capitol crawl. And police came to arrest them. And there's a, this young girl, uh, Jennifer Heelan, <laughs> who said, why don't you arrest that man that, walking up because that's how he gets in, but this is the only way I can get in the Capitol. Well, that got on the evening news and that pried it right out of the house. So we got out of the house right after that. We had really people of goodwill. Well, I, I must say perhaps the most important person in terms of support and enabling us to reach across the aisle was the President of the United States, President George H.W. Bush, was a big supporter of this from the very beginning. He never wavered. 
He never backtracked. He was always in there helping us to get it done. In fact, a little story out of school, his chief of staff was trying to undermine us. Mm -hmm. So I met with President George H.W. Bush and we talked about this and he assigned a guy by the name of Boyden Gray, his chief counsel, to take it over and get it through. And Boyden Gray did a magnificent job. Now, Boyden Gray and I could not be more different in our political philosophy, <laughs> but we remain friends to this day. He did a magnificent job of helping us get through, but having the backing of the President of the United States was just was monumental. It was just so helpful. And then we had people like Bob Dole, Senator Dole, who himself was disabled. When he first came to the Senate in 1969, his maiden speech on the Senate floor was on uh, disability inclusion in 1969. So we had Senator Dole, we had John McCain from Arizona, who was just always, always there for us, always was there for us on, on disability uh, issues. Um, well, you know, I, I have to tell you another story. You know, I was not the first person to introduce the Americans with Disabilities Act. The first person to introduce it was a Republican by the name of Lowell Weicker, Senator Lowell Weicker of Connecticut. Now I was his chief co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. Well, the Republicans were in charge at that time. Well, then Lowell Weicker lost his reelection. The Democrats took over the Senate. So then it fell to me to mm -hmm. then reintroduce it as I did. And then my chief co-sponsor was a Republican Senator from Minnesota, David Durenberger. So that's sort of the history of that. It was bipartisan from the very, from the very, very beginning. We then, because of the Supreme Court decision in 1999, the Sutton Trilogy, yes. we had to have the ADA Act amendments of two, uh, that took us eight years to get through. But finally in 2008, we got through the amendments that basically <laughs> straightened out the Supreme Court, if I can say that, told the Supreme <laughs> Court really what we wanted to do. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and <laughs> with all this going on now with the Supreme Court. Um, but that was in 2008. And again, we had good bipartisan support for that. But I have to tell you that if we tried to bring that up today, I don't think we'd ever get it done. Hmm. One example of that is after that, after 2000, in 2000 and um, uh, after 2010, 2011, we wanted to um, vote to join the United Nations, uh, the Universal, um, uh, 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 the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was a convention drafted by the United Nations and it's based on the ADA. I know because they came to see me about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to join. But by then, Senator Cruz from Texas had come in and railed against it. And we lost it. Mm -hmm. And to this day, over 180 nations have signed on to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I think there's three, if not four, that haven't. And one of them is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. I'm still hopeful <laughs> that at some point we'll be able to, President Obama signed it, but the Senate has not adopted it. Uh, and I'm hopeful that sometime in the near future, maybe we can join with the rest of the nations of the world. So that's a long winded answer to your question. Uh, I'm sorry to see that a lot of this has degenerated into some kind of partisan aspect, but it shouldn't be. It's always been bipartisan and it should remain so. Yes, sir, absolutely. We've heard you often say before in that regard that the biggest barriers to people with different, with uh, disabilities is often not physical barriers, but actually attitudinal barriers. Going deeper, how can we as employers and employees and colleagues of individuals with disabilities work to counteract those stereotypes and prejudices? What can each of us do that are watching you here today? Well, uh, first of all, don't be afraid to let people know uh, how you feel and what you're doing in instances like this. Uh, let, let people know about the stories of persons with disabilities and how they're working and what they're doing. 
Um, again, and it's, 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 it's part of the whole disability pride movement. Persons with disabilities have nothing to be ashamed of or, or try to hide or cover up as part of disability pride. And there shouldn't be any kind of social uh, stigma attached to any kind of, of a disability. So what each of us can do is if we run across it, you know, there's, as you go through airports, you know, you see those signs. If you see something, say something. Yes. <laughs> if you see something that is discriminatory against a person with a disability, say something. It doesn't have to be confrontational, but I think a lot of times people say things without thinking. Um, perhaps they have not been sensitized or they don't understand that a person with a disability can be a whole, a whole person like anyone else. Maybe a, just a gentle reminder. Or in clubs and in, 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 in organizations, I always say to people that belong to Rotary Clubs or Lions Clubs or Knights of Columbus or whatever it might be, or church groups, um, civic groups, you all have programs. You have speakers in and you have programs. Make sure that part of that program structure has something to do with disability awareness. Bring in a speaker, bring in someone with a disability, bring in someone who has worked with it to start getting people to think about this and to break down those attitudinal barriers, which sadly still exist to this day. Um, and, uh, but awareness, openness, um, reminders, and those of us involved making sure that, 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 that persons with disabilities are brought in as part of our programs, um, uh, that type of thing. To me, that in every, every, every instance where we can insert into our social, economic, and even personal lives, it's just another little thing. You know, people have work, people make their friends. Um, and for young people in school, um, when you have friends over and you have some gathering or something, think about persons with disabilities that you know to make sure they're part of that invite structure also. Mm -hmm. And especially with kids in school. Uh, in fact, one of the best things breaking down attitudinal barriers in the past have been young kids now are, are integrated with kids with disabilities in school. Mm -hmm. So they learn about it at an early age. They're not afraid. They don't have these biases built in. And so as they grow older and they're going to work alongside someone with a disability, it's not a big deal. But making sure that inclusive gatherings. Yes, absolutely. I think, sir, we only have time for one last question for you. I know there's some media folks that want to speak with you as we move on with our program. And you spoke to this a little bit in your prepared remarks, but just give us the inside scoop. As you, you look ahead uh, in your crystal ball 10, 20 years out, um, what do you see as the future of the ADA? Um, and what do you hope for for, for that, that uh, Civil Rights Act for individuals with disabilities? Well, I hope that there will be a seamless, a seamless transition in life for young persons with disabilities who go through school, go through education, where they are told at an early age, have your dreams, have your aspirations, there aren't any limits. <laughs> uh, to know that there shouldn't be any limits on them, to keep promoting that, that that's seamless. That when they get into school, I, I mentioned what we did in WIOA, it just pains me to see young people, all young people get summer jobs and they get after school jobs, but not kids with disabilities. That's why I put that 15% set aside in there. Yes. So that's seamless kind of thing. So kids with disabilities, and then they can also think about post-secondary education like through mm -hmm. the TIPSID, you know, the TIPSID program. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, in, in that. So it's not just learning a craft or a trade, but maybe they want to go on to a post-secondary education. So the, the seamless kind of thing, and where as they go through, um, there's not, there's less effort to break down these barriers. I, it just still pains me that so many businesses still have not made themselves accessible. It, and it's so simple. Uh, or even in transportation. Now, again, one thing, that some things are gonna ha happen, you know, we're gonna have driverless cars pretty soon. Technology is gonna be fantastic. Think about a blind person calling up a car, take them someplace, drop them off, come back and pick them up, whatever. This is coming. So all of these new technologies from the very beginning need to be designed for persons with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. So that's what I see in the future new technologies, enabling more and more people with disabilities, a seamless kind of a structure, uh, and where a person with a disability is just, it, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not a hindrance in any way to their achieving their dreams and their goals or aspirations. They become fully included in all aspects of society. Now, Nancy, I will close with this. Um, you talked about sign language. I had an interpreter, but I've lost sight of my interpreter now. <laughs> but, but when I talk about inclusion, I always talk about the, the ASL sign, the sign for America. Uh, I'm going to teach you and anyone watching the sign for America. And here it is. You take your two hands and you put your fingers together like this, right? put all your fingers and you move in a circle in front of your body that's the sign for america think about it everyone is connected together we're all connected together no one is left out in this circle of life in america that's that's the future Senator Harkin, um, we from the state of North Carolina and from the Office of State Human Resources, Department of Health and Human Services, really want to thank you for your time today. Uh, we are grateful to your service to our country, and we are grateful for your continued advocacy for individuals with disabilities and what an important uh, person you are and what significant contributions you have made. So again, thank you for your time today. Thank you for the lesson. <laughs> that one I will not forget. And at this point, I think, uh, Ryan, we will turn Senator Harkin over to the media and we will take a short break before we come back to talk to our panel of state employees who are going to underscore many of your messages, sir, of the importance of full economic independence for individuals with disabilities. So thank you again, sir. Thank you very much, Nancy. Yes, sir. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Senator Harkin. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in about 10 minutes with our panel of state employees to continue this conversation in celebration of Disability Employment Awareness Month. So be sure that you hang with us. Great time to go get that third or fourth cup of coffee. And we'll see you in just about 10 minutes. Now, I'm supposed to leave and go on WebEx. Yes, I think you disconnect from here, Senator, and, and go to WebEx.
I want to welcome everybody back to uh, the second portion of our Disability Employment Awareness Month celebration, a panel conversation with state employees. And uh, we're definitely looking forward to hearing from them. We'll have Kathy Deal, the counselor in charge from uh, the NCDHHS Vocational Rehabilitation, Mark Gazell, director of the Governor's Highway Safety Program, Barbara Lucas, a casework technician for the DHHS Vocational Rehabilitation Services Division, and Tim Moore will join us, a district veteran service officer from the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. And this portion, this panel discussion will be moderated by Gina Streety from the Office of State Human Resources. But before we go ahead and uh, get all that squared away, we do wanna share with you the voluntary self-identification of disability portal that is available to agency level employees in Beacon uh, HR self-service portal. Now, some of you who are watching might not have that capability. You may be a university employee. So a reminder, this is for all agency employees, state employees, but this is still good to know. So before we do that, I did wanna share a video with you about the importance of self-identifying in this portal and how it can really help you kind of uh, take control of the narrative surrounding your disability if you do identify as someone that has a disability. People with disabilities. So I made that. Of course, I began with technical difficulties there, so I apologize for that. We'll go ahead and start the video right at the beginning for you. And there are closed captions as well. I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at birth, which impacts my balance and mobility. Because of my disability, I knew I wanted to help other people with disabilities, so I made that happen. I graduated from college, earned a master's degree in social work, and now I work for the state as a rehabilitation counselor, helping people with disabilities find successful employment. Personally, I have always disclosed my disability because it is part of who I am, it's something I'm proud of, and I never want to feel like I have to hide my true self at work. Self-disclosing also allows me to control the narrative surrounding my disability. Therefore, I attempt to prevent assumptions made by employers about my ability to adequately perform the essential duties of the job. If you have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, have a record of such an impairment, or are regarded as having an impairment, I encourage you to voluntarily self-identify at the Employee Self-Service Portal in Beacon. This new functionality allows employees to share their disability status quickly and confidentially without having to interact with HR or a manager. The information is kept confidential. By self-identifying, we help make hiring practices more inclusive, improve and increase access to accommodations, and gain support from our colleagues, managers, and leadership. I gained greatly from self-identifying and strongly encourage you to self-identify also. So at this time, what I wanna do is walk everybody through how to use the self-identification, voluntary self-identification of disability in the, uh, e, uh, sorry, the ESS uh, Beacon Portal, Employee Self-Service Portal. So the first thing you'll do, you'll log into with your NCID, um, as most of you should be familiar with right here. From there, you can see up here in the top left-hand corner, you'll click My Data ESS for Employee Self-Service. Following that, you'll click the My Personal Data tab either here at the top or down at the bottom right where you see the computer. From there, you'll click Voluntary Self-Identification of Disability. And then it's just as simple as reading through, seeing if you do have one of these disabilities. Now remember, these include but are not limited to these right here. And then you'll check the box below, either yes, I have a disability, or have a history um, or record of having one. No, I do not, or I don't wish to answer. And then you'll click submit. Now you can go back in and change that at any time, which is the really nice thing about this. And it's also completely confidential. Uh, nobody will know that it was you that answered. It just gives raw numbers in the system to allow us to know how many state employees identify as someone with a disability. Uh, it does not give you any more of your personal information other than that. 
So that is the end of the voluntary self-identification of disability portion of our uh, event. And what I'd like to do now is go ahead and ask all of our panelists if they would go ahead and unmute and bring up their video for us so we can see everybody. And I'd like to ask Gina Streety to do that as well. She will be our moderator for this portion of it. So if everyone can go ahead and unmute and bring up their video, that would be fantastic. It's telling me the video cannot be started because the host and halted it. All right, let me, let me take a look there for you, Tim. Let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to start video and we'll go from there. There we go. Awesome, the beard looks fantastic. And Barbara Lucas, let me ask you to start your video as well. Okay. Awesome, and I hear everybody there. And let's just do a quick sound check. Mark is out, can I hear you? Yes. Fantastic. I think so. Awesome, Kathy Deal? Yes, I'm here. Gina Streety? Here Gina, it looks like you might be muted. You may have to unmute on your end. Go ahead and try again for us. <clears throat> Tim Moore, let's go to you next. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Awesome. And then uh, Barbara Lucas, you are our last one to test your audio. Yes, good morning. All right, fantastic. Well, it looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with Gina's audio. So what I'm gonna do is I'll go ahead and, and take over this portion and ask the questions. Uh, we, we did uh, have some contingencies in place in case we ran into any technical difficulties today. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So Gina, I'm gonna go ahead and stop your video. And if I can figure this out at any point in time, I will. So uh, let's go ahead and, and kind of go through everything here. First of what I wanna do is introduce our panelists. And we have Kathy Deal, counselor in charge with the North Carolina Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. In 2001, she earned a dual master's degree in rehabilitation and substance abuse counseling at East Carolina University, go Pirates. She has over 22 years of experience working with individuals with disabilities, including group homes and mental health and substance abuse counseling. 16 of these years of service have been with the North Carolina Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Mark Gazell serves as director of the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program and also serves as the governor's representative for highway safety and has directed statewide public safety and health campaigns for over 20 years. He was appointed by Governor Easley to chair the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities, where he oversaw the council's innovative disability inclusion activities. He is the founder of both Access Vote, a nonpartisan organization working to improve voter access for voters with disabilities and the North Carolina Disability Action Network, a statewide organization providing a public policy voice for people with disabilities and others concerned about human service issues. He has a long and impressive professional background, uh, too much of that to share right now, but his experience will certainly add to our discussion today. He also has a phenomenal dog named Truman, who I believe is a Golden Retriever St. Bernard mix, who I've had the chance to meet, uh, and it's just fantastic. Barbara Lucas is a casework technician with students and transition services at the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, where she has worked for the past 15 years. She is a North Carolina native, born and raised in Wilson, and has worked nearly 25 years, worked nearly 25 years in banking, which brought her to the Queen City area, where she was introduced to vocational rehabilitation services. Her love for people reflects through her desire to encourage and inspire everyone she meets. And she's often quoted and well known for saying, you can hear a smile. So keep that in mind as you go throughout your day. And then finally, Tim Moore. Tim is an accredited veteran service officer with the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. He's a disabled combat veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars in support of ongoing efforts for the global war on terror. Tim advocates for the veteran population in North Carolina to attain benefits and entitlements that they may be qualified for from state and federal governments. Tim has been working in the field of advocacy since his medical retirement from the Army in 2016, and it's been with the state since 2018. And Tim, we certainly uh, thank you for your service uh, to our country. So at this time, I want to go ahead and move into our, uh, our panel discussion, if we can go ahead and do that. And so um, very briefly for all of you, we'll just kind of start with what I see on the screen first, which is Mark, and then we'll go to Kathy, Tim, and Barbara in that order. 
if you could just briefly describe your personal experience with having a disability, how it has um, impacted your work and any obstacles you may have faced, um, and then how that's led you to where you are today. Well, I'll start. Um, as somebody who was born with spina bifida, I have used mobility uh, enhancements in, in a variety of ways, crutches, braces, now wheelchair to get from place to place. Uh, it's certainly obviously been impactful in my life. Um, and in terms of my professional service, it's certainly been an issue that employers at different times have had a difficult or have thought they would have a difficult time dealing with. And there are a number of occasions where there have been positions and jobs that I have not received uh, because somehow they thought that those human services related uh, work, nonprofit related work and policy related work that I was uh, trying to achieve required a level of toe dexterity, which frankly, I have not found to be the case in my professional life. Uh, but um, it, it has certainly been impactful. The, uh, the prejudices, the preconceptions have all been difficult to address. Uh, but I think that forums like this can help. Kathy, same question for you. Okay. Um, well, my experience with ADHD has been challenging all my life. Um, I was labeled right from the beginning as a bad kid because um, it's a hidden disability. So people who don't see it, don't realize what's going on. Did you think a little bit differently? Um, how to work? three times harder to get the same thing done that most people would take for granted a lot of times mentally, having to learn and incorporate things. Um, it has impacted my career. It's been very difficult for me in many ways um, to be able to focus, even just complete simple tasks. Um, but I've learned some tools over the years that have helped me get grounded. Um, learned a lot, a lot. Um, to help me survive, like Coast Code Management Organizational Tips and this training that VR has provided has been wonderful and helpful for me. Um, and it, it's, I've just learned that you know, I got to push myself harder, not giving up. I like to prove the bullies wrong. You know, those that bullied me along the way. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to show you. You know, um, I feel it's helped me grow in my career. And now, now I'm able to you know, have a supervisor position after all this time. Um, if it had not been for the understanding and support there over the years of the agency and management and co-workers, I don't know where I'd be today, to be honest. It's, it's just been made, made a tremendous difference. Tim, let's hear from you next. Uh, well, when I first was discharged from the military, um, you know, I had mobility issues uh, pretty extensively due to uh, some injuries I had sustained. Um, I had to use a cane for mobility for a good portion um, of the first few years. Uh, it wasn't until I learned the appropriate level of exercise and physical activity that, you know, helped me to leave the assistive devices for the most part. Um, but then I also have, you know, anxiety and, and other forms of um, conditions that I still have to learn how to overcome on a daily basis. So it certainly has posed uh, unique challenges and uh, it's taken the necessity for me to take a step back and really think before I speak or think before I act um, so I don't fly off the handle. And Barbara, for you. Yes, uh, I am diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, uh, which affects the extremities, the arms, the legs, what have you. Uh, it is genetic and uh, uh, it's progressive, but I am fortunate in that mine has been very slow in progressing. And I think a lot of that is because I'm just determined not to give in, to push, continue to push always. And in fact, I have told my manager that I won't retire. I'll be right here, uh, you know, forever. She doesn't have to worry about losing me. I'll be right here. But uh, as I said, I had, I worked, worked in banking for about 25, almost 25 years. And then I was laid off because of a merger. Uh, and then as I began to look for employment, I would go into interview and as I rolled in on my scooter, you know, the eye level would go from my eyes to the scooter. So right away, you know, you know, I knew what that interview, how it was going to result. But then uh, 
it, I, my mother, who happens to live in California, was the one who suggested, well, why don't you try vocational rehab? Okay, mom, what is voc rehab? I've never heard of it. So, you know, I say it's one of the best kept secrets here in North Carolina, but that's what brought me to, you know, I, I was brought to the Queen City area. I uh, became a client uh, with vocational rehabilitation and I'm now employed. And they have given me, Vogue Rehab has given me the, the uh, accommodations that I've needed to continue to work and to, to continue to go. And so it's been kind of a domino effect from there. This next question, open-ended, anybody can feel free to answer. We talked about the importance of self-identifying your disability in that uh, portal uh, for state employees at the very beginning of everything. But having a disability is often stigmatized. Um, and I know that that is, is part of the reason that revealing it can be very a very difficult decision to make. Uh, was that ever an issue for any of you worrying about that stigmatism? And, and if so, um, how did you overcome that? What was kind of the, the deciding factor in deciding, hey, I, I am gonna self-identify as someone with a disability? And anyone can answer well, that question. <laughs> okay, with me, I found that uh, for a very, very long time, I never actually said I have muscular dystrophy. I would say I am diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, not really accepting that. So that was a big part of it for me. And uh, it still, it, I, it was only maybe about 12 years ago that I actually uh, came to terms with that after a very, very bad fall and I was no longer able to ambulate. I, you know, I, I am non-ambulatory right now and I, you know, I have to have my scooter or and uh, a handicap accessible uh, vehicle, and, but still it is difficult to say handicap and you don't want to say handicap. We are disabled, but differently. And uh, so that, it, that was a turning point for me. For me, when I, um, whenever I disclose I'm a veteran, it almost creates this negative connotation in a sort um, and leads people to assume a lot of different things. You know, oh, you're a veteran. Are you crazy? Do you have PTSD? You know, things of that nature. Uh, so, and a lot of that's because of the awareness um, and popular culture with movies and, and things of that nature, um, which raises awareness of veterans with disabilities. So I never really had the opportunity to decide, you know, if I wanted to disclose it or not by volunteering the information that I'm a veteran, a lot of people then assume. Um, so in a way, I almost had to alter my way of thinking to accommodate others' uh, perceptions and ideas mm -hmm. and misconceptions about me as a person uh, just because I am a veteran and you know, had to convince them that uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't going to be a negative um, situation with me working with them or so on and so forth. Well, let's move on to, let's move on to the next question. Um, Mark, uh, this question is for you. Um, and these are from Gina's notes. So she says, in discussing the ADA with two former colleagues recently, so th this is not me speaking this, but, but the bitty Gina, uh, she said she heard one say, managers need employees who are good multitaskers, uh, people who can quickly take on different roles, especially in light of the pandemic where everything has changed. She added, people with disabilities are pretty much limited in what they can do. How do you respond to that kind of thinking? Two, two things. Uh, I'm, well, I'm floored. Uh, but the, there's two things that come about. One, that person's a bigot. I mean, come on. We would never in a million years say that about an African-American. Put the words African-American in front of, of persons with disabilities. We'd never say that. We'd never say that about a woman. Of course not. But saying that about people with disabilities is somehow considered to be all right. The second thing, and this is what floors me, is that's not just wrong, that's 180 degrees wrong. That's the exact opposite of what's true. What is in fact true is that having a disability gives you the ability, it exercises the muscle 
in one's head about being creative and being adaptable and being frankly a multitasker. We have to do that all the time. I gotta be creative about figuring out how to get the Starbucks uh, off the shelf when I uh, go to the Harris Teeter. You know, and then I gotta be creative about how to get in my car when somebody else is parked too close. And then I've gotta be creative about how I'm gonna reach the paper above the copier. I gotta be creative all the time. And so the idea that you can't be a multitasker and have a disability is ridiculous. Multitasking is our secret sauce. It's what we bring to the table in, in an employer situation. So, you know, and uh, it's interesting what Senator Harkin said about COVID and how COVID has impacted people with disabilities. For the longest time, disabled people have been saying to employers, you know, I'd love the ability to work from home. Maybe I could work from home and have a, I don't know, a, a, an adjustable schedule and uh, be able to video conference with my employees because it can be difficult to get from place to place. I don't have the transportation or there's physical limitation. And employers have said, oh no, that will never work. We cannot possibly be productive if we have people video conferencing all the time and working from home with adjustable schedules. Well, guess what? That's what we're all doing now. And it's worked out fairly well. So the idea that, that this kind of situation we're in now is, not, uh, is somehow uh, disadvantageous to employees with disabilities is ridiculous. And the very broad concept that this person has put in this, this bigoted concept that we're unable to be multitaskers is, is just that. That's, that's a great point that you make, especially about the adaptability. I'm not at the mouth a little bit there. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. The adaptability is certainly a, a huge thing, just a personal anecdote. I have a, a friend of mine who is really a tremendous golfer, and he has cerebral palsy and um, can only swing with one arm. And what he's able to do on the golf course is far better than I'm able to do on the golf course. That's not saying a whole lot, but, um, but he is pretty incredible uh, when he's out there. Kathy, I want to bring you in on the next question. Do you feel that there is an overall um, lack of knowledge about reasonable accommodations, um, policies, and what the ADA covers? And if so, how do we counter uh, that lack of knowledge? Yeah, I do believe there is a general lack of knowledge. Um, I've heard employers express concerns about accommodations, may cost too much, or individuals, on, you know, maybe an insurance risk. They don't seem to understand what is meant by a reasonable accommodation. It could be simple change in application or, you know, or doing a way task is done. Just because it's done differently doesn't mean it's being done wrong. Um Many automatically assume the accommodation create this huge uh, undue hardship, but what I try to tell them is, look, not only you're accommodating your employee, but you could be accommodating future consumers coming into your business as well. You know, so I always stress that, especially when I do. Um, I think a good start to counteract this lack of knowledge is by educating employers, increasing their understanding about the ADA itself, like, like we're doing now, the events and this increased social media. I think that's, this is really heading in the right direction. Um, maybe have some sort of like resource support line for them, some sort of ADA line. There may be some things out there, but I mean, I'd be aware of, but that might be a, a thought to kind of counteract that. Discussions and trainings on how to have a conversation with an employer out of, without fear of losing your job. That's what a lot of people are afraid of. You know, if I, if I reveal this, am I going to get on a chopping board? Um, many individuals, even some individuals with disabilities themselves, are not fully aware of what ADA is. I've used that term to several because you know all of our all our consumers do have disabilities, and they look at me like, "What is ADA? I mean, what exactly is it? What does it do? What is it? How's it going to help me? You know, but it already has. You just don't know it is sometimes. And so the lack of knowledge really, really um, is important to, to increase that. And reaching out to employers and sharing ideas of what is reasonable accommodations and how to provide that without a hardship on them. Um, uh, I've heard both of them express the feeling and, and they're intimidated by it, you know, like uh, they feel like, like I said, being forced to, but then yeah, I come back with that. Hey, wait a minute. You're not being forced. 
you're actually increasing your business and you're really helping. It doesn't, it's not going to be, it's not forced to do anything. It's going to be harmful to your business. So that's, that's how I feel. Awesome. Thank you. Tim, I want to turn to you on this one. Um, how can employers address attitudes that contribute to workplace discrimination um, that create obstacles to acquiring or maintaining employment? So perhaps uh, if employers are not able to assess an applicant's ability to do the job or they feel uncomfortable with the person's disability itself, how can employers address those attitudes in the workplace to overcome discrimination that, that there may be? Well, I think that there's more so uh, naivety that needs to be addressed. You know, people have a naive impression that as someone is differently abled, that they are not going to be able to perform the same functions or tasks. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, individuals with, with uh, disabilities, whether it be physical, mental, whatever, um, often think outside the box to reach up above the printer to get the paper. Um, a lot of it comes down to um, just raising awareness, not babying or coddling the individual, you know, some tasks might require an, an additional hand, some tasks they might not be able to do, uh, but at the same time, you know, give them the opportunity. If they say, hey, I can do this, let them, let them. Um, when it comes time to accommodations, you know, some people might require a slightly different chair than what is typically provided within the office setting. Um, that's a reasonable accommodation. That, that should be something that you know, the, the HR departments should be willing and eager to jump on to make life and their ability to work more, uh, more practical. Um, I had another note here, you know, and it's something that we all ultimately need to come to understand and to accept is that not everyone's going to be willing to understand, you know, they're, we can't change everyone, but what we can do is change the way that we see others um, and the way that we interact with others. You know, treat everyone with dignity and respect. That is obviously the golden rule. Um, however, a lot of times, uh, you know, if a management team enforces and encourages a open community and an open open door policy where you know the individual with a disability can come in and, and discuss an issue with them, then the manager should be able to address the concerns of that person readily. And Ryan, I'll, I'll go ahead, Mark. A little bit, a little bit on that. I, I like what, uh, I think Tim is 100% correct on, on that. And I, I completely agree. I would also say that you know, discomfort in the workplace for certain groups of people, it's like an American tradition. You know, sadly, uh, you know, 80 years ago, we had, uh, some people had discomfort with African-Americans. And 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we had discomfort with women in the workplace. Uh, and now there's discomfort with people with disabilities in the workplace. It's not, uh, you know, it's our responsibility to integrate the workplace. And the fact that some people are going to be uncomfortable with that is just something that, that it, we're gonna have to live with. You know, prejudice rarely survives experience as the saying goes. And the more we integrate a workplace uh, and expect that discomfort, but side on the fact of that, uh, side on the side of that integration, then the better off we're gonna be as a society. There are talents that we bring to the workplace that employers are not tapping and that hurts employees, that, but that also hurts employers. And so the sooner we just get over this discomfort thing, the better off we're gonna be. These accommodations that many of us ask for, they cost as a general rule, uh, very, very little. It's just a matter of innovation. And people with disabilities, we've come up with our own we know what our, uh, our, our reasonable accommodations are because we bring those to our everyday lives. And so we can work with employers to make that happen in a low cost, easy, sensible way. So reasonable accommodations should not by themselves be anything that employers fear. 
if they work with a new employee, they should be able to make those happen easily. Mark, that's kind of a perfect segue into the next question. I want to direct this, Barbara, to you. How has being a minority with a disability impacted your work experience as far as the intersectionality of it all? Um, so maybe if you can describe a little bit of maybe the stigma even attached to minorities with disabilities um, and kind of speak to, to how that has impacted your experience in the workplace. Uh, yes, it has been, just as I'd mentioned with uh, when I was uh, interviewing for jobs, you could see, you know, as I think one of the questions, the triple jeopardy syndrome, uh, you often hear and see that because you have, uh, I am a woman, I am uh, uh, African American, I am disabled. So those three strikes are against me right there. But those three strikes don't have to limit what I can do and what I'm capable of doing. A lot of this has to do with my attitude toward myself because that transfers over to the, uh, to the employer. And as they see that positive attitude that I bring to the table, that's going to make them more relaxed. That helps all of us actually. And so often there are, um, uh, you you have coworkers that 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 don't understand. They have to be trained. All of these employers have to be trained, and you have to show them. You know, it goes there. And so right now with COVID nineteen, you know, I am still with the triple jeopardy syndrome because of my age, because of my uh, weakened immune system, because I am an African American woman. So. A lot of it has to do with how we approach that and see the employers see that in us. And then that puts them at ease and that lets them to, uh, you know, allows them to make better accommodations for us and for us to work together and to discuss what, what you need, what I need. Kathy, for you, um, how are things different as compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago, something like that. Have things gotten better, much better since the ADA was passed in 1990? Or are we still, um, as Jennifer Mizrahi of Respectability said during one of our previous ADA anniversary webinars, are we still woefully lagging? And I think uh, Senator Harkin touched on this a little bit as well, that there's been progress made, but um, there's still a lot to go. But where are we as compared to maybe a decade or 20 years ago? Well, I, I feel like Senator Harkin said, you know, we, 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 we have made some improvements, made some strides, but we do, I do feel overall we do have a long way to go. Um, but it is recognized more and more, I think, um, but getting that quality employment, that area still is, you know, and that's what I do for a living. And I still see those, uh, the stigmas every day, all the time. Um, so if we can work on that and work, like I said, hitting with the youth early on when they're in school, um, now reach out to the teachers, uh, reteaching the parents as well of those students. I think that's going to help because sometimes that can bring them down where, um, cause they're always told you can't do this. You can't do that. You know, and the parents are not being very encouraging cause they weren't taught that. So you're still in that generation thing because they, they were taught the same thing. So, um, but breaking that and educating, I think it's going to be the, um, I mean, again, but at least we're having those well overdue conversations that we've been needing to have. I think that's a, that's a key. Um, and some of the things he's done with the WIOA Act, I think that has just made tremendous impacts with the schools. Um, I think it'll take several generations to change those perspectives, though, just like it did when we, uh, to develop the perspectives. You know, we got to, had to negative all these centuries, so it's going to take a, a little while to really get it going. I want to turn this over to Tim on this next question. Tim, um, You've um, shared with people before that your current job has, has totally changed your life. Um, and you also uh, always have a quote from General Patton at the end of your emails that says, if a man does his best, what else is there? Share with us a little bit about how your job has changed your life and why that quote means so much to you. Thank you. Um, you know, I work for the veteran population. My agency uh, primarily focuses on hiring veterans for some of the positions. Um, and many of those veterans have documented disabilities from their military service as well. Um, some of them, you know, in the past have been amputees, uh, wheelchair bound, um, or any other various form of disability from their military service. So in that aspect, it does make me feel like I'm more at home because, 
you know, when I go to a meeting or I go to a conference, it's just a bunch of people that are broken and messed up like I am um, <laughs> to an extent. So it's kind of, a, kind of a fun scenario anytime that we all get together. Um, the quote itself uh, is a personal reminder more so than anything else that, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to try my hardest. And at the end of the day, I can hang my hat up and, and keep my chin up knowing that I did everything I possibly could. Um, you know, sometimes my best isn't quite enough. Uh, and at that point, you know, I have to reach out for assistance from someone else um, or ask for guidance from one of my mentors or, or one of my coworkers. And it's really having that mindset, knowing that, you know, having that peace of mind, knowing that I gave everything that I possibly could for the veteran and for the people that I'm trying my hardest to assist, that they're going to end up, you know, feeling vindicated and rewarded, um, whether their claims are approved or denied, because they had someone listen to them. They had someone there who understands and who supports them. We've got time for, we got about 10 more minutes or so. So uh, we'll ask a few more questions. Um, one would be, this is open-ended for anybody to answer. So feel free, anybody to jump in on this. Thoughts on Senator Harkin's remarks, particularly when he talked about the need to re reboot Medicaid um, from a health model to supportive services. Um, just anybody with any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I would say that this is a major, major problem. You asked earlier about the ADA and progress that we've made. And I agree with, with Kathy that we've made some progress in some areas. One of the, and a lot of progress has been around public accommodations. The public accommodations are much better. Uh, you can generally, there's a way to get on a bus. Generally, there's a way to get on an airplane. Then generally there's a way to navigate the public spaces for people with mobility impairments. So that's good. Uh, where there hasn't been a lot of progress, of course, is, and the main topic here is around employment. And this whole Medicaid model thing is a significant problem. Essentially, we're saying that we will pay for the services people with disabilities needs if they live in a congregate setting like a nursing home. But if you want to live at home, well, then we got a whole lot more hoops to go through. And that's just ridiculous. We need to totally flip that on its side. And, uh, th and that would, would, I think, probably as much as anything, increase the, uh, the employment rates among people with disabilities. It's also a real bipartisan argument because, you know, Democrats may be more concerned about providing social services and equity. And so this does that. Republicans may be uh, especially concerned about fiscal responsibility and making sure that we don't spend more money than we need to. Well, this does that as well. This would actually be a significant cost savings if we were to flip uh, the Medicaid model on its head and not have this bias toward uh, basically institutionalizing people. Uh, it's, it's, it's simply amazing that this is where we've gotten, but uh, uh, through the leadership of Senator Harkin and others, I think it can potentially change. If it does, uh, that's just a game changer for a lot of people. Any other thoughts from anyone on the, on the Senator's remarks? Let's not, well, let's move on to the next question. A lot of people watching, human resources professionals, we, we would hope at the very least. Um, so how do we as employers support the need for skill upgrading, professional development I'm speaking about now, um, for employees with disabilities? And have, do any of you have any stories in regard to that? I can jump in again. Uh, you know, I think we simply do that the same way we do this for others as well. Uh, we make sure that that's an expectation, but we provide the reasonable accommodations and assistance to allow people to, uh, to meet those skill upgrades. You know, we've got still with all the jobs that, that we have in state government, we have, um, we have uh, the, the primary responsibilities, the things that the job uh, people in those jobs must do. 
uh, the core competencies that are required. And um, uh, we need to make sure that we, that we meet those. And many people with disabilities can. Uh, and the expectation should be that people acquire more skills, but you know, merely having a disability, depending on what it is, is not going to compromise that. Uh, for some, it may mean some more accommodations, but it doesn't mean it needs to be compromised. I agree with what Mark was saying there that with the right training, just like with any other employee, right training and the support of the support of management, you, you can do anything anybody else can do. I mean, we just have to have that support in place. I think that's that's going to be the good. And, and the training, like, um, provide, and most time employers provide that just to other other employees. So why not to us? You know, so, yeah. That's a kind of a great segue into, into this next question. We probably have time for about two more. So uh, we'll, we'll go with this one now. There's kind of a myth that individuals with disabilities might be a liability to employers. We talked about that earlier with, with oh, employees with disabilities are limited or that they might not be reliable as far as attendance. They can't keep up with other employees. But the facts are that studies kind of show statistically employees with disabilities have better attendance. They're more committed. Um, they perform exceptionally well in their roles. Um, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Office of Disability Employment Policy, Jennifer Sheehy, recently stated that people with disabilities are experienced problem solvers with a proven ability to adapt. What message, and again, this question for everybody, what message from your own experience and experiential learning in working with others would you give to managers and supervisors to help them understand the value of having more inclusive hiring practices and considering your demographic for key employment opportunities? I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, I, you know, first and foremost, I can't agree more with uh, Ms. She, uh, is it Sheehy? Yeah. Okay, with Ms. Sheehy's uh, sentiment, you know, people with disabilities do think outside the box, as Mark was saying earlier, um, in order to complete a similar task that someone without a disability, you know, can do without thought. Uh, what it all comes down to is the commitment and dedication that the individual, you know, the employee has um, to be able to perform all of the necessary functions of their job. Uh, employers, you know, they certainly should consider a small or, you know, potentially small accommodation. And that accommodation could really mean the absolute world to the individual, you know, employee with the disability. Um, that's going to show the employee that their company cares about them, that they want to create a warm and welcoming and inviting uh, employment opportunity for them. And it's going to have, you know, the result will be that the individual who is who is receiving the accommodation is to be grateful, wanting to work harder, wanting to show that they're capable. Um, so it's going to be a very symbiotic relationship if, you know, even small accommodations are made. I also think employers uh, need to be educated more. Uh, they need to know what the, what the employee needs. And a lot, lots of times it's just a matter of listening. Uh, listening to that employee and uh, they may not know exactly what they need themselves, but the, but the two of them together then can come up with the appropriate accommodations because we do adapt. We adapt with everything that we do every day, you know, just very, very simple things. As I came, rode out of the house this morning, uh, I, there's, there's the problem of how do I close the door, okay? because I can't reach back over my shoulder to get to it because I'm on a scooter. I have to have some way to close this door. And so you make uh, uh, concessions, you come up with ways, with, with ideas that work for you. And that carries over to your employer, to your employment, with everything that you do, we're always making concessions. So the employee, they need to learn. They need to listen to us. I really wish that, uh, you know, as employers, employees went in for an interview, or that, uh, that they would listen to the, uh, the, to the applicant first before they charge in with all the questions of, can you do this? Can you do that? This is what we need. This is, listen to what I have to say, because I can offer lots of things that perhaps you didn't even think of that are going to help you and your company uh, with all that that is needed, you know, 
with very, very, very minimal, minimal uh, accommodations. So they do need to listen. They need to be, they need to, uh, to be trained. I want to end with this uh, last question for everybody, and, and we'll hopefully we'll have everybody answer on this one. I um, want to focus on what's most important about disability employment awareness. If you could share two or three words or thoughts to guide hiring managers, HR professionals, and organization leaders, what would they be? Well, I'll, I'll start with that, uh, Ryan. Um, I said it'd be like an oar, open-minded, accepting, and respectful. Like an oar guides a boat, let these three words guide our thoughts and decisions. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. My quote would be, hear us, then see us. Mm -hmm. I would have to say, don't look at the surface, look at the heart of the individual. And, and mine is not nearly as good as the previous three, uh, nor as concise. But what I would say is that there are a lot of things that people with disabilities, because of the disability, can add to the workplace. It is not some pejorative to get over. It's a value add that that employee brings, just like they bring other life experiences to your work. And as Senator Harkin mentioned with his brother working in the tool shop, uh, you know, there are skills that we bring, not in spite of the disability, but because of it. Well, I want to thank all of you, our panelists, for being with us today, Kathy Deal and Tim Moore, Barbara Lucas, Mark Azell. also want to thank Emily Jones and Brian Tipton for being our sign language interpreters today. Of course, want to thank Director of State Human Resources, Barbara Gibson, for being on in the first hour. And obviously, uh, thank Senator Harkin, Tom Harkin, for being on with us. And of course, thank all of you who watched today. Um, and in closing, I just want to turn things back over to Nancy A. Strike for a couple of closing thoughts. But thank you, everybody, for participating today. I thank you. I just want to echo uh, Ryan's comments on that list of thank yous. This has been a, a collaborative and very positive effort to bring these important issues to the table. To the panel, thank you for that very uh, great conversation about your experiences as state employees. I know uh, as the Office of State Human Resources and from Director Gibson, we want to thank you for your service to the state and your continued commitment to public uh, service and your role. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for being here with us today and bringing this important message forward. Uh, we will reach back out to you at a date forward for more opportunities to continue this conversation. So we, we got you now. And as Ryan said, we also want to thank uh, very much uh, Senator Harkin for his inspirational comments this morning. Uh, a wonderful opportunity to speak with him and gain his perspective. Uh, to Director Gibson for being here with us this morning and, and kicking us off to this great event. Um, we also wanted, in addition to the interpreters who have been, been seamless, I thank the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, not only for leading us to some of our panelists, but for their continued support and technology and other issues today to make this an accessible and positive event for individuals with disabilities. Uh, and lastly, we wanna thank the staff at the Office of State Human Resources. Uh, we've put a, a lot of effort into making this event come forward. And so many thank yous to uh, everyone that made a contribution here today. So again, echoing all those comments, all those thank yous, it's been a wonderful event. Uh, this event will uh, be recorded, has been recorded and will be available on YouTube in about an hour in its entirety. You want to share this event with other people or watch it again, uh, please feel free to go back to YouTube and this event will be available for you to watch in its entirety. With that, again, a final thank you and we hope that you continue to stay safe and have a wonderful uh, day as your afternoon progresses. Thank you everyone for your efforts today and we look forward to seeing you in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.